fiction, science fiction, horror, fantasy, crime, LGBT, thriller. You have now entered the house of mystery with your hosts, Eric Shapiro, David North Martino. John Copenhaver and Al Warren. Heard on KCP 106.5 FM Los Angeles. 102.3 FM Riverside. And 105.0 AM Palm Springs. We've got a great filmmaker and producer with us. Um, his name's Paul Davids. Thanks for being on the show. You're welcome. Thanks for having me. Oh, it's a pleasure. Um, so now um, you've got a new film out, um, Marilyn Monroe Declassified, and the website's MarilynDeclassified.com. And uh, I know you've done such films as Roswell, which was a big one with Martin Sheen and Kyle MacLachlan. And uh, uh, let's talk about you. How did you get into Marilyn? Like, what were you doing beforehand that brought you to Marilyn? Well, I had. Uh recently finished the Life After Death Project film. Uh, it was on sci-fi. It was uh, an examination of a particularly fascinating case about life after death. And I was always aware that uh, there was quite a controversy about Marilyn Monroe's death, which had been ruled at the time in 1962 a probable suicide. And yet the controversy and the objection to that started almost immediately. So it always been in the back of my mind that uh, maybe the circumstances of her death were unresolved and covered up. So since I was, uh, you know, curious about the realm of uh, spirit, spirit communication, communication from the afterlife, and had had an experience with a psychic detective Dorothy Allison, when I was a producer on F. Lee Bailey's Lie Detector Show, uh, had a very, very open mind to the possibility. And that someone had suggested to me that Marilyn's spirit was very, very disquieted because people still think she committed suicide, and she didn't. So that was the one thing. The other thing was that I happened to be invited to film the original color separation negatives, these are very, very large negatives, and they're in like bulletproof plastic now. There's over 20 of them, of her Golden Dreams calendar photo, which was the famous nude that was controversial earlier in her career. And when I filmed those, there were other people present that talked about the history of that and Marilyn's life that I thought, maybe there's something really here. Maybe this could become an original feature documentary. Hmm. How, how do you uh, determine uh, what's real, what's not? And I mean that is, and there's so many, you know, nowadays especially, there's so many stories that go out on Facebook and, and all the media, not just Facebook, you know, um, you know that about everybody, not just her. And there's a lot of fake news, you know, like, you know, Maryland's... Oh, the, yeah. Yeah. The, the fake news is terrible, terrible, terrible. And there was a, a really dismaying fake news story within the last year declaring that uh, there was a CIA agent who had confessed on his deathbed to having murdered Marilyn and it had clues in there that it was you know that it was made up because it talked about her affair with Fidel Castro which is completely absurd and but people don't know right away when these fake stories come out and 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 you know that they are uh, being used, and and these things need to be completely dismissed. But that was pretty much an easy one because it came from a site that was noted for those kinds of things. But you know, I'm very very cautious about about what to accept. In, in this case, Marilyn Monroe classified. I've got really firm evidence from the real people, the witnesses, the testimony, the statements that go back to the year of her death. I'm dealing with the people who were actually involved and what they had to say and how it changed over the years. 
there were secrets kept that people, well, some of those who had testified began to recant after about 20 years and change what they said. And their changes became more consistent with other things that we knew that made us feel that there was a massive cover-up. There were two police chiefs of Los Angeles, uh, Daryl Gates and Tom Redden, who both indicated years afterwards that, um, well, one, Daryl Gates indicated that Bobby Kennedy had been in town the day of her death, something that Bobby Kennedy had always denied. So you have to ask why. Why, why was his presence in Los Angeles being uh, covered up at that time? Um, and Tom Redden, another police chief, who said that uh, Marilyn's death was covered, was, was handled uh, as a, a top secret uh, intelligence operation, meaning there was disinformation issued, that facts were withheld. So you want to get to the bottom of it. You go back to the source, the original people. Then what's new? What do I add to this mystery that's been going on all these years? Well, uh, in recent years, there's been the release of FBI documents on Maryland. Uh, things that had been classified that we didn't have access to before. Same with the CIA, because she was watched by both the FBI and the CIA. She had attracted interest to both of those agencies. So someone, I felt, had to put all of this together, like a jigsaw puzzle. It's a great mystery. But can sense be made of it, and can we tell who were the players, who were the actors, uh, was Marilyn, in fact, murdered? Uh, and I, I've concluded absolutely yes, no question. It was a contract killing. So who was involved, and what can we learn about that? It's all in the movie. Years of research. You know, the last people we had on were uh, Margolis and Buskin uh, talking about yeah. their book. And uh, they, they pretty much, um, you know, pinned it on... Um, RFK and saying that uh, he did it and you know you know he was the one that did it and um, and so did uh, you know in Crip 33 I, I also noticed that as well it was kind of Milo aimed that way too uh, what's your opinion on that well actually let's take them one at a time let's talk about Milo first in Crip 33 uh, he talked about Bobby Kennedy's involvement with uh, Marilyn in fact uh, he claimed that she became pregnant by Bobby Kennedy and that there was an abortion in the months before uh, her death, that he had promised to marry her, uh, to get a divorce from her and marry her, and uh, that she became very upset. She was threatening to go public about a lot of things. He never uh, pointed the finger at Bobby Kennedy as having been responsible for her death, but certainly was a party of interest. Now, Margolis uh, and Buskin... Uh, it's a very good book. I disagree with parts of their conclusions. And, uh, you know, that's fine. You can pick and choose between us. I do not think that Bobby Kennedy was responsible for her death. Um, I do believe he was at her house that afternoon. We know from the housekeeper, from what she finally testified to, that, that they had a, there was quite an argument that day between them, that they that uh, they had both become very, very upset. Um, but we know a lot more than that that makes us um, uh, look in other directions for uh, who did it. Uh, now, I know that uh, Buskin and Margolis placed a lot of emphasis on testimony on the housekeeper's uh, nephew. Right. Um, Eunice Murray was the housekeeper, and her nephew... Uh, Norman Jeffries, I think, was his name. He had a lot of things to say uh, years later, in which he did claim that Bobby Kennedy returned later that night with uh, a couple of other people, and that that was when Marilyn was murdered. But if you want to go to Crypt 33 for a moment, again, he says, no, he says that it was a mob hit, and he names the three hitmen. Um, now, as to who ordered it, well, it was a mob hit. It was ordered by Sam Giancana. I conclude this because there was a confession by uh, relatives, close relatives of Sam Giancana came forward in a book called Double Cross. 
and said that Sam Jean kind of had confessed to them before his death that he had ordered it. Merrill had said, but he said that he ordered it on behest of the CIA, that it was really a CIA contract to the mob. They did that in those days. We know that. You know, that's history you can research. Check out about the mob's involvement on behalf of the CIA in an attempt to assassinate Fidel Castro uh, and Trujillo, uh, who was assassinated. Look into those details, and you'll see that the CIA used the used the mob as kind of an arms like uh, hit squad when they didn't want something traced back to them. Now, was Giancana telling the truth? You know, there is a CIA document that surfaced. It was signed by the head of counterintelligence back in 1962, um, and that was James Angleton, and it meshes very, very closely with the Sam Giancana uh, confession. In time, it was shortly before her death. Um, as far as concern that she was going to go public about some things that were top secret that she wasn't supposed to know, that concern uh, was was there. So these pieces link up in a way, I think, that um, that uh, Buskin and, and, and Margolis uh, haven't uh, put together. Now, Who's right? I mean, you need to see Marilyn Monroe de de uh, declassified, and uh, you'll see how all those pieces of the jigsaw puzzle fit together. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, but wouldn't that have been really difficult for JFK in the sense that uh, didn't he know he was telling Marilyn things that could, you know, really threaten her life, or he just wasn't aware? Well, he was, oh, uh, you know, he was probably aware, but he was careless. He was re he had a lot of mistresses. And, uh, you know, a number of them uh, he talked to. It was Mary Pinchot Meyer, mistress for a long time. She was assassinated a year uh, after his death, right when the Warren Commission report was coming out. She knew too much. There was uh, Judith Exner Campbell. She was a go between between JFK and Sam Giancana uh, because they had, they had, a business together. The, the mob had helped put Kennedy in the White House by delivering Chicago. And yet the Kennedy administration, through Bobby Kennedy, moved fiercely against the mobsters and tried to put them all behind bars. That's why the Giancanas, the family, has said that the murder was timed intended to be an entrapment of Bobby Kennedy. Uh, they were trying to solve two problems at once. On the one hand, they had been uh, asked to eliminate Marilyn Monroe because of the problems that she presented to the CIA from knowledge of classified things and concern that she was getting ready to talk. And on the other hand, because they had wiretaps, they knew Bobby Kennedy was there that day. There's another reason they may have known that he was there that afternoon, too, and that was Bobby Kennedy uh, was actually staying at that time uh, with the man, a lawyer, who had been a lawyer for Sam Giancana. He represented the mob. He represented Sam Giancana at the Senate crime hearings. And you can look at the old newsreels. You'll see them in Marilyn Monroe Declassified. You'll see it's the same guy. So, you know, Bobby Kennedy was with him. Bobby Kennedy takes off for Los Angeles. We don't know the extent of loyalties, disloyalty, treachery, who told what. We do know for sure that there were wiretaps. And the mob felt, according to the Gene Conner family, that if they struck then, that day after Bobby Kennedy had been there, that the police investigation would come up with his fingerprints that uh, the investigation would show uh, letters, uh, you know, maybe there would be the diary, there'd, there'd be things that would tie her to the Kennedys the mob felt would help bring the Kennedys down. That's what they wanted. So, you know, read the uh, uh, Buskin and Margolis uh, book. You know, I probably agree with 95% uh, of it, except for their conclusion that Bobby Kennedy actually was involved with... Uh, murdering her I, I i do not think that's the case yeah it's hard to see that myself i agree um I, now who had her bugged i mean i i know cia i guess fbi um you also mentioned hoffa why would hoffa have her bugged well that's a really uh good question um first of all let me say when you see marilyn monroe declassified you'll see testimony from the wiretap guys 
One of them was Fred Otach, who actually did the dirty work. He bugged her house while she was on a trip to Mexico. Um, and he also planted bugs at Peter Lawford's Malibu estate. Peter Lawford was brother-in-law to JFK, and they would have big parties there. We think it may be at one of those parties that JFK first met Marilyn Monroe. He was working on behalf of, uh, of Hoffa and Sam Giancana. Now, Hoffa was head of the Teamsters. They were deep into the mob's pockets as far as money. Um, or was it vice versa? Excuse me for a moment here. The point was those early casinos were built in Las Vegas um, with uh, heavy mob participation. And the, the Teamsters um, pension fund, I don't know whether it was le legal or illegal, but a lot of that pe pension fund money went into the hands of those that were building those uh, casinos. So they were all in bed together. Now, um, uh, Hoffa, he hated the Kennedys, Robert Kennedy as Attorney General. Same with Sam Giancana. And when she became a sort of plaything of the Kennedys, first JFK and later Bobby, sure they wanted to wiretap her. They were looking for anything that they could find to use against JFK and bring him down. In the end, they all got theirs. I mean, Jimmy Hoffa, you know, he disappeared. Nobody found the body. And in the case of Sam Giancana, I think it was eight bullets, most of them to the head, in his own home, assassinated. Um, so yeah. everybody got paid back in the end. Yeah. It's a sordid, sort dark story of JFK's uh, Camelot, and absolutely true. Yeah. The 60s was really, wow. I mean, it was really about assassinations and killings and, and um, you know, covert operations. There was so much of it going on. Um, I, I just can't believe it. I, now, now, there was also a big communist panic in the 50s and, and, and earlier 60s, and um, a lot of people don't realize that, the, you know, younger listeners now. And so Maryland actually had a tie to communism and left as well, right? She walked right into the middle of it. Yeah. First of all, let me say a little about Maryland's background. You know, she was an orphan. Well, her, her mother was still alive, but she grew up in an orphanage because her, her mother was uh, psychologically incapable of raising her, and her mother was institutionalized. So for all intents and purposes, she was an orphan who went from foster home to foster home. Very, very poor. Uh, I mean, she had just one or two, you know, orphanage uniforms to wear, uh, you know, the blue shirt, the blue skirt. She had she had nothing in her really early years, so she identified with the undertrodden. And some of the books that she read were, you know, by communists. Uh, she was, and the other thing was, she was very sympathetic to integration and to the plight of of, of blacks. Um, and in those days in America, the big push, there was a big push in favor of uh, integration and equal rights for blacks from the American Communist Party. The big point of departure for her was when she married Arthur Miller. He was a great playwright, wrote Death of a Salesman. But he was, you could say, he was either communist or he had very strong communist leanings. Now, in those days, there was a House on American Activities Committee and Senator Joseph McCarthy and a witch hunt against any American citizens that had ties to the Communist Party and to, to Russia and Russian communism in those days. So many people from Hollywood were called to testify in front of the House on American Activities Committee. And those that refused to name names, um, some of them went to jail. Uh, it was it was a crime not to cooperate with the committee. And Arthur Miller, who had recently married Marilyn Monroe at that point, was called before the committee and was considered uncooperative. So at that point, you had not only people like Hoffa and Giancana interested in wiretapping Marilyn Monroe, 
uh, but certainly the FBI. And when she went to Mexico and visited a Vanderbilt heir who was a communist, uh, then the CIA got involved in watching her too, because the CIA's jurisdiction is out, you know, espionage outside the United States. So now she became a person of interest to all these government agencies, and she was in the thicket of it, and she didn't know it. She really, she really didn't know what deep water she was in. Yeah, you know, she's a bit naive about it, and uh, it set up the circumstances by which she became a serious target. Now, now, was her husband Arthur Miller um, blackballed from from working? Or, um, good question. And let's see if I have the answer. I know that the House on American Activities Committee they censured him, which was really uh, bad news. But then they took it back. I don't know. He he made some concessions. Uh, it was decided that uh, he had not committed a criminal offense by refusing to give them whatever information they wanted. Now. Uh, he he was he was not censured like other writers were because one of his scripts called The Misfits, which was directed by John Huston and which starred Marilyn Monroe, they got divorced around that time. Um, I think that was made in 1962 or released in 1962. So uh, he wasn't blackballed from Hollywood in that sense. They made his movie with his name on it. There were other writers that couldn't work anymore under their own name. They had to write all the things anonymously, use a different name, get paid under the table. Yeah. Yeah. So, but but her marriage to Arthur Miller was a certainly was a huge setback to her personal safety, if not her career. You know, and, and what's this? I guess her the last person to talk to her on the phone was Jose Balanos. Jose Balanos yeah. uh, claimed he was the last to talk to her. He has a, I think, a very consistent story that held up. He was extensively interviewed. I think that it's in a book by Donald Wolf about Marilyn Monroe. He also Donald Wolf concluded it was murder. And he reports on Jose Bolaños, uh, as did others. But the mainstream people think Peter Lawford was the last one to talk to her. But Bolaños said that he, uh, well, he had he had been her escort to the Golden Globes that year, the Golden Globe Awards. She had met him on her trip to Mexico. He was a Mexican screenwriter, quite handsome, and he said that he had been in Los Angeles that night, he called her, they were talking, and she heard some kind of commotion at the door, and put down the phone, and that uh, she never returned to the phone, that uh, something was going on in the background, and then someone came, and the phone just clicked, uh, disconnected. The other key thing he said, I think, very uh, impressive to ponder, he said that she said she knew a secret from the president that was so uh, so big that it would change the whole world one day. And he didn't ever admit whether she told him what the secret was or not. But since he had that conversation, an interview may have been with Donald Wolf. It was years later. Uh, you have to ask yourself, what was it that was secret at that time in 1962 that would have still been secret by the time this interview happened? That gets us to things like the Roswell case. I'm interested in that because, as you mentioned, I was the producer of Showtime's movie Roswell. The controversy about, all right, what happened in Roswell in 1947? Military announced that they'd recovered a crashed flying saucer, a flying disc. And then they changed the story, uh, said it was a weather balloon. They changed the story multiple times through the years. Now, in the CIA document that I mentioned, uh, with James Angleton's signature, which we are 
really sure is a legitimate, bona fide document for many reasons I can I can get into. That document uh, charted the contents of a wiretap conversation that Marilyn's friend Dorothy Kilgallen had with um, a Marilyn associate in, in New York. And some of the things that Marilyn had been told by JFK came out in that wiretap. And one of them was a, a visit to a secret air base by John F. Kennedy for the purpose of examining things from outer space. It said that in the CIA document, and Dorothy Kilgallen speculated that that must have had to do with that case of the down flying saucer in Southwest. That would have been Roswell. So, very fascinating to see the way these pieces come together. And, and how do you feel about that with the, with the Roswell? It, would you, you know, I've heard I've heard a lot of theories on the show, and um, you know, one of course being aliens, UFO, others being that it was attached to uh, Nazis uh, because, you know, they took the scientists that were doing the flying wing, you know, and uh, perhaps it was something that they were working on. H how do you feel about that? Well, to make the movie Roswell, I did extensive research, but mainly I was involved with those who were doing uh, great in-depth research at that time. Uh, one of them, Kevin Randall, who's just come out with a, a new book, I think, Roswell for the 21st Century, he's backed off in his certainty of it having been extraterrestrial. Uh, I don't view kindly to his, what they call his recanting, because I know some of the things that he was told at that time. For example, the provost marshal, who was head of the the, uh, the military police who recovered the debris from the field, the debris that uh, intelligence officer Jesse Marcel said in around 1986 was really was not made on this earth. It, it couldn't have been. And one of the things that Randall and John Schmidt, his co-author, were, were told then by the provost marshal. Uh, well, he didn't want to talk about it. The provost marshal said he'd made a promise to President Truman he wasn't going to talk about it, and he said, no, I'm not going to talk about it. And Kevin Randall said to him at that time, well, look, can we ask you this? He said, you know, we've been researching this, and a lot of evidence seems to point us toward the fact of that having been extraterrestrial. You know, not from this uh, planet. Uh, he said, "Would would you would you tell me that you know that we're going off in some uh, a, a wrong direction and that there's some other direction we ought to be looking?" And he said, "No, I wouldn't say that you were off in some wrong direction. I wouldn't say there's some other direction you should be looking." You know, he was told it was extraterrestrial then. Uh, I, I've been told personally that it was extraterrestrial by uh, Dr. Edgar Mitchell, who walked on the moon, by astronaut Gordon Cooper, who called me to a meeting after the movie came out and told me that we hit it right on, that it was accurate. Uh, I personally am convinced that all of the contrary theories are wrong, are either, are either deliberate disinformation or are mistaken and that it was extraterrestrial uh, contact. There's so much good testimony from solid people about that, people who were there at that time. So um, I think the fact that in the Marilyn Monroe document, signed by the head of counterintelligence, that mentions JFK's visit to a secret air base for the purpose of examining things from outer space, I, I can agree with what Dr with what Dorothy Kilgallen concluded then, that that referred to the downed flying saucer from outer space of the Southwest in 1947. I think all these pieces historically interlock. Now, one more point, important to say, how do we know that CIA document is real? Because some people charged, oh, it had to be a forgery. Well, no, because as it turns out, author Don Burleson went through the Freedom of Information Act procedures on that, 
looking to the CIA for transcripts of the wiretap referred to in the document. And as all, although the first search by the CIA said, we haven't come up with any transcripts, but you can appeal this if you want to, he appealed it through the proper procedures, and the CIA accepted his appeal of their original denial. And as he quite rightly pointed out, the CIA never would have accepted an appeal based on a document that was fraudulent, it wasn't theirs. They would have just kicked it right back and said, bogus, bogus document, don't bother us anymore with it, but that isn't what happened. So you can take that document to the bank, yeah. and, and you have to consider all the implications of what flows from that. So see Marilyn Monroe declassified, you know, it's out now, it's at Amazon, either Blu-ray or Standard. It was put out through a d distributor uh, named Film Rise out of New York, for the United States and Canada. So you can see all this uh, evidence for yourself in, in the documentary. Years, years to put it together. It's there for you. Do, do you think then that um, uh, all presidents become aware of Roswell and what, what, what is really hidden? Um, that's a tough one. You know, because how would I know, you know, about all presidents beyond what's been said with rumors? I think that the best evidence on the answer to that question is at a website called presidentialufo.com by uh, a Canadian, Grant Cameron, has put together that site. And he has done extensive research on what we should believe about what each president uh, knew or knows and what each president has said about UFOs at different points in their, their lives. I became very interested in the Bill Clinton and Hillary Clinton connection to this, partially because my uh, family has a connection to the Clintons through uh, my late father, who was a professor of Bill Clinton diplomatic history at Georgetown University, and we kept in touch with the Clintons through the years, and I let Bill Clinton know very early on of my interest in the Rottle case. I supplied him with a great deal of material about it, uh, both when he was in the White House and after after his terms as um, president were, were done. Uh, of course, it was under Bill Clinton that that Pentagon or Air Force report came out denying Roswell was extraterrestrial, and talking about the mogul balloon and the crash dummies and all of that stuff. It's just, I, I, I don't accept any of that. It's all disinformation. I don't think Bill Clinton believes those reports either. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. And, you know, Dorothy Kilgallen, now she was murdered as well or died of an overdose or something like that, right? Okay, it's a cloudy death situation. Yeah. I, I, think, I think that... Um, Officially, it was an overdose uh, of, uh, you know, uh, like the barbiturates, um, similar to what they said about Maryland's uh, death. Um, I don't know that anyone has proved, in her case, that it was anything else, and uh, proved that she was murdered. It's just suspicious. It's always been suspicious, particularly since... I think she declared on the show, What's My Line? She certainly declared publicly that she knew the truth about President Kennedy's death and the public hadn't been told. So that put a big target on her, yeah. all right? Yeah, yeah especially back then. Uh, <laughs> now, when we talk about how Marilyn died then, um, it was, there's, there's a couple of different theories on that. Now, she had a sleeping pills and some sort of uh, other antidepressant drug that she was taking and yet um, they say she was overdosed. Uh, what can you tell us about that? Well, the Giancana family claims that it was a, not an enema, but a suppository injection of the drugs that she was taking. Um, and that jives with part of the autopsy report that talked about this purplish discoloration at the colon that was never satisfactorily explained. So uh, that's consistent. And things that are not consistent with the idea that she swallowed a lot of pills, 
no glass was ever found in the room where she was found, where her body was found. No glass was ever found, you know, for, for drinking water. How did she, how did she take those uh, pills? And some of the research indicated that the toxicity level of her blood was so high, it was so massive, that she would have died before she even finished taking that many pills. In other words, she would have been dead en route to get there for her blood toxicity to go to that level. And there were none of the uh, none of the crystalline residue that's usually found in cases like that was found in her stomach. Some researchers have tried to bring science into it and said, no, no, you know, the stomach acids, they could have theoretically dissolved those capsules, theoretically would have been possible they didn't see the residue. All right, they tried that research, but to me, um, not convincing when you put it together, you know, with everything else. And the, the first policeman who came to the scene uh, and... Uh, and discovered her, Sergeant uh, Jack Clemens. He was suspicious from the beginning, saying, didn't look like a suicide to him. Looked like it was staged to look like a suicide. He's seen overdose victims before. There was always vomit. None in this case. The body always contorted. Here, in this case, the body just laid out perfectly as though posed. So, that's, you know... Again, see Marilyn Monroe declassified. You'll see for yourself all the evidence, all the testimony is there. This thing was covered up massively. You know, Buskin and Margolis got that right. Don Wolf got that right. Milo Spiraglio got that right. All those authors who did wonderful jobs in contributing to the picture that proves the falsehood, the deception that was used to cover up the circumstances of her death. But, and bottom line for me is, what uh, Police Chief Tom Redden said, when he said that it was handled like a top-secret intelligence operation in the hours after her death because of the involvement of the Attorney General of the United States, I think what he meant was that it was kept secret to try to protect Bobby Kennedy because he was vulnerable in that situation. He was in town. He was with her that afternoon. He had an argument. Um, they got him out of town. They spent five or six hours after her body was discovered, before it was officially reported to Sergeant Jack Clements, a low-level sergeant at the police department. But higher-level operatives had been working on cleaning up the scene for hours. That's why Marilyn, it looked staged to Sergeant Clements when he got there. So, bottom line, was covered up, lied to, she didn't commit suicide, it was a contract killing, it was a terrible, terrible episode in American history, and it was sort of presaged the violence that was to come. I mean, it was one year approximately before the assassination of President Kennedy that Maryland was uh, the result of a contract killing. Do you think this will ever become mainstream, that people will ever accept this, or something will ever happen where um, we'll kind of know? You know, you know all, all I can say as a filmmaker, because filmmakers who do what I do, I've done a number of these kinds of films. You know, We struggle to get the real information together so people can appreciate it. I think if millions of people were exposed to Marilyn Monroe Declassified and saw what's there, I, I will say this. Everyone who's seen the movie, who has talked to me about it, has said, I now feel I know how Marilyn died. I feel it's, I feel it's there now, and, and my questions have been answered. So what does it take for that to become mainstream? What does it take for it to become mainstream that... Lee Harvey Oswald did not act alone as the sole uh, assassin of President Kennedy. What does it take when we get involved in these massive cover-ups, lies to the public, deception that endures for decades? Uh, sometimes these things are just uh, never reversed. The, the full truth never comes out unless you do massive research or 
you know, go to sources like my film on this. Uh, go to my film Roswell. To uh, I mean, it's a, it, it's the film is a fictionalization with actors. It's not all entirely true. It's not a documentary, but it it shows close to what the witnesses said really happened at Roswell. Uh, I made the film Jesus in India to investigate the mystery of the missing years of Christ from age 12 to age 30, not talked about in the New Testament at all, except for one sentence. One sentence to cover 18 years. In India, they have a, a, a widespread belief that Jesus was in India among Hindus and Buddhists during those 18 years, and that he returned to Judea to begin his ministry. I investigated that at, at length. Spent many, many weeks in India filming across 4,000 miles of the country. That film is Jesus in India. Um, and, uh, you know, I've done other similar documentaries. I think I've done about 10 films now, uh, in addition to all the... My work on all the early Transformers cartoons, I had like 80 credits on those, and credits on Star Wars books, and then I began doing these kinds of films. Have you always wanted to do documentaries like this? Like, Was this kind of what your passion is? Yes, you know, I, but, but honestly, as a kid, I started out with this intense interest in science fiction, horror movies, and special effects. Um, and this was way before the digital effects of today. I have a son who's a visual effects supervisor in Hollywood. He has that credit on like 40 major movies now. He's in his mid-30s. You, you'd know the name of every film that... Uh, you can look him up at imdb.com, Scott M. Davids. Every film that he's done. Uh, as a kid, I wanted to do that. I wanted to do special effects. I was enthralled by the movies of Ray Harryhausen, the Sinbad movies, Jason and the Argonauts. I was an avid reader of Forrest J. Ackerman's famous Monsters of Filmland magazine. And then after college at Princeton, I was accepted as one of the first students at the American Film Institute, Center for Advanced Film Studies, Beverly Hills. And then my interest broadened, and I decided I wanted to direct, I wanted to produce films of all different kinds. I mean, it's not just documentaries, Starry Night I did with actors, before We Say Goodbye, Roswell is a Screen Actors Guild film. So I, I, I've done both. But it, it took me years from the time I finished at the American Film Institute before I got my first leg into the industry and my chance to make films. You know, it, it takes a lot more, um, well, I don't want to say work, but certainly a lot of research and effort and time to do a documentary correctly. Yeah, it's, each one has taken me years. And uh, there's a biography I did of uh, Timothy Leary called Timothy Leary's Dead. It was very big at the Toronto Film Festival. And now that's online. I think you can get the DVD or you can stream it. Um, and, uh, you know, it's just years of research and editing. Uh, and compiling the materials that goes into the documentaries. And because my father was a historian, and a very famous historian, I've always been interested in looking at these dilemmas of history uh, like a mystery, you know, and that's the name of your show. You're into these, these mysteries, and I always have been into historical mysteries. Well, you know, I will say, uh, we get we get all sorts of people that we talk to, but you're you're very sourced and researched on your on your programs like this. Like it's not just like this fantasy, uh, and I think that might be the problem with a lot of the mainstream. Um, but there is a lot of um, I don't know. I guess to say BS out there, you know, just yeah, made up. Yeah, yeah, and and people are having to learn to be really discerning. Yeah. Uh, about what it is that they are hearing, particularly with so much, uh, you know, unsupervised stuff out there on the on the internet. You know, and I think people are rising up. You know, that they have to uh, look very very carefully at they hear a conspiracy theory. Well, you know, why should you believe it? I mean, one of one of the conspiracy theories that I hate 
is the idea that we never went to the moon. You know, I just feel, you know, if ever there was a BS, you know, that's BS. So I know that there's some people who passionately believe that. I just feel they're all a little bit I terribly know. misguided, you know. Yeah, we've had it all. Flat earthers, we, we have all of that on. And, um, yeah, I just like to have more sourcing. There's just a lot of, which is, this is, this is great. I'm glad that you've done this work, and I think people Al, will appreciate it. Al, I wanted to mention, because I know we don't have too much time left, but I, I wanted to mention uh, when I made the Life After Death Project, which was very personal for me, because I, I mentioned Forrest J. Ackerman, the editor of Famous Monsters magazine, who I knew for, you know, over 40 years. We became very, very close he was an atheist, didn't believe God, didn't believe in any afterlife. But he conceded to me before he died that if it turned out that he was wrong about afterlife and you know he woke up to some, he said, the great science fiction convention of the sky, he said, yeah, maybe I'll drop you a line, but don't count on it, don't count on it, right? Yeah. Well, the Life After Death Project, which you can easily find Amazon, you know, DVD, streaming, renting, whatever it is, downloading. Um, that was a feature I did of all of the really strange things that happened to me after Fari Ackerman's death uh, that suggested that he did drop me a line and he was in touch with me. And he was giving me the benefit of having physical evidence in these contacts that I involved scientists in studying at three different universities. It's a massive fabulous, wonderful case of a friendship that didn't end with death. And after making the Life After Death Project and making a sequel to it, um, both of those come together in the DVD. If you get that, that, you get the two movies. One of them was on sci-fi. But anyway, after doing that, there were academics, professors who said, Paul, you really need to turn this into a book, a book that uh, you know ha that has a glossary of all these different things that have happened, a book that has the scientific reports from the scientists, including the chemists that worked on the the strange evidence involved in this case. There's so much data, you know, put it all together in a way that we can read it and study it in that way. Perhaps it'll be taken seriously in the academic level in a way a documentary would. So I did that, co-authoring with Dr. Gary Schwartz of University of Arizona, Tucson, who studied life after death probably for 20 years. And that book is called An Atheist in Heaven. It's a major work in terms of its length, and it just got a very, very good review in 14 times. Very, very proud and pleased of that. So these are all uh, things for your listeners to turn to when they're done with Christmas and New Year's and have a little spare time. <laughs> yeah. yeah, good luck with that. Now, just just uh, on, a, on a note on the last one, an atheist in heaven, has this changed your view on, I don't, I, religion's the word I, I was going to say, but I'm thinking more spirituality. Has it sort of changed how you feel about life and death and, and what happens? Oh, absolutely, completely, completely, because I was raised without any religious practice, um, and, uh, you know, my mother was, well, both my mother and father were agnostics, non-practicing, you know, they had no, no use for prayer or any of that. So, skeptic, yes, I was raised as a skeptic, a non-believer in any of this, even the paranormal. Even UFOs, I didn't accept any of it until life took over and things happened to me that made me see my view had been too narrow. And as far as the afterlife is concerned, oh, I, I'm, I'm quite convinced now. All these things that have happened, they're just undeniable and they have continued to happen. It wasn't just dropping me a line one time. It's been like eight years now and... Uh, these things continue right up to two weeks ago. Um, and they're specific. They're helpful. They are, are, there's clearly an intelligence behind these things that have been happening uh, to me. So, uh, yes, you know, I'm, I'm even now very open-minded now to the whole concept of miracles. You know, the, the, the miracles in the Bible 
you know, I, I just dismissed it all, you know, when I was growing Just myth, you know, just, just myth, you know. Yeah. Couldn't happen. Didn't happen. People made it up. I wouldn't say that anymore. You know, I'm perfectly prepared to believe that impossible things happen that our ancestors wrote about, and they did the best they could to let us know. And uh, these kinds of miraculous and unusual and unexplained things are still happening today, and people are reporting them more widely than ever before. Yeah. Well, it's certainly been an amazing conversation. I really enjoyed it. Um, uh, where can people get a hold of you, or do, do you have a website that people can uh, contact you on? Sure. Um, my website actually has a lot of my art on it, because I'm a painter and artist, too. And so it's called uh, Paul Davids, and then a little hyphen, and then the word artist.com. And you'll see about, you know, my, my books and, and movies, and uh, if you've done some music... And then um, the paintings, there's, I think, hundreds of them. And there's a way that I can be contacted there through that website, pauldavids-artist.com. And as far as finding the movies I've done, if you go to imdb.com, which is the Internet Movie Database, and look up Paul Davids, uh, and click on the Paul Davids who was involved with the Transformers show, You'll have a list of all the movies, uh, television movies, and uh, uh, all the Transformers shows that I was involved with. There were 79 of them, I think. And, and you can find almost everything that I've written or produced uh, at Amazon. I think, it's, I think it's almost all still available. Oh, fantastic. And actually, for our listeners, we'll have it linked up on our website as well. well I'll put up quite a few of them. Um, very interesting subject. Um, again, thank you very much for being on the show. Um, we've had producer filmmaker Paul Davids. Thank you for having me, Al. Really appreciate it. To find out more about our show, guests, or to listen to past shows from our archive, please go to www.houseofmysteryradio.com. Show is over for now. Was it as good for you as it was for me? Well... Good night. This has been a production of Something Weird Media. I'll be back.